Is that music? Is that? It's loud enough for you? Yeah, that'll work. Yeah. I love my ace. Well, you can turn it down. Yes. <laughs> Charles comes and Mike comes. Put him on this. Yeah, tell Get in front of your camera. Let me see something. In front of you right here. That's where you want it? Yeah. Okay. Appreciate it. Right. You got to use that one for Charles also. Yeah. Not working. Okay. No problem. Perfect. This is Dr. Cavill with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Welcome and thanks for joining us for the only weekly sports talk radio show that is dedicated to exploring the sporting HBCU diaspora with its unique HBCU cultural identity, including the teams, the bands, coaches, athletic directors, presidents, commissioners, executive directors of the Celebration Bowl, all that jazz out there. Also want to say... We look at the, uh, as well as we look at the sport management business practices in the competitive sports industry. The show seeks to provide innovative, progressive, and informative dialogue about the week's HBCU sporting events, issues and ideas from a fan perspective. We look at the Southwestern Athletic Conference, better known as the SWAC, the Mid-Eastern Athletic Conference, better known as the MEAC of the NCAA Division I, the Southern Intercollegiate Athletic Conference, SIAC, the Central Intercollegiate Athletic Association, the CIAA, of the NCAA Division II Gulf Coast Athletic Conference, GCAC of the NAIA and independent programs such as Tennessee State of the OVC, Hampton of the Big South. <laughs> hey, man, that's what they said. I'm just telling you. Man, that, that just some cool when you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Langston uh, of the Sooner Athletic Conference coming out of the Central State Football League. We got them uh, going in. And so without further ado, we're going to get into the news of the day. Before that, let me give some shout-outs. We have some stellar followers that have jumped on the line. Chad Jones is already in the house, and the first thing he said was, Bishop? <laughs> no, he read it this week. Yeah, I think he got some, <laughs> something to tell you. Oh, boy. We even got Ralph Cooper on the watching. Check that out, man. That's all right. D.T. Green, Yolanda Mitchell, Michelle, excuse me, his own, Michael Lee. Charles Bishop, I see you there. K.C. Price, Corey Williams, Lawrence McCall, Tabby. Man, Tabby, did you hear your intro? That's Tabby that does the intro for us. Uh, get it done like that. We appreciate you all joining us, Corey. Watley Jones all in the house. As we have some big information. We'll see if we can catch you up on all the ins and outs. A lot of changes. A lot of stuff. A lot of moving parts, and it's just getting started. I keep telling people with Kevin Allen in the house. D.T. Green. Bert Simmons. Bert Simmons, my ace there. He's already packed his bag. He ready to get to Atlanta. Yes, indeed. We're going to do it big when we get there, Bert. Ernest Miller's the third. So let's get these viewers mm -hmm. uh, some and listeners, if you would. Give them an update of what's going on. What is the latest news in HBC sports? Uh, you might need a direct line. Things are changing I, I so fast and so hot. It's, it's happening uh uh, fast and furious, but uh, of course, uh, Ralph mentioned it earlier, but uh, Wheeler Brown, athletic director at Jackson State, uh, is out, uh, and it looks like uh, Jackson State is looking for a new athletic director. Man, we want to know what happened. Well, two years, you know, um, unfortunately, and I, and I say this about the culture of Jackson State, is, you know, 
the success of the football team can drag on the on the president and can drag on the athletic director. Wow. And you've had two successive three and eight seasons, and you know Jackson State fans, if nothing, they're just going to continue to be like, you got to do something. Somebody has to do something. So unfortunately, uh, Wheeler Brown. Um, Let me uh, make sure I get you on film <laughs> so they know exactly who talking. <laughs> Send course. all messages. Yeah, uh, to, to, yeah, exactly. But I'll say this: uh, for Wheeler Brown and the saying goes, "Once a tiger, always a tiger." He'll always be part of Jackson State. Yeah. Uh, I think family. he got did some great work, right? There, like you said, but the emphasis in a lot of ways on the football program mm -hmm. and what people don't always uh, re recall is the fact he's a new president. Exactly. And sometimes you can be doing a lot right if it's new president. They right. just have different people that they believe in uh, more than you oftentimes, and that's the way the cookie crumbles. That's the way the cookie so crumbles. Any, so who's the interim? Uh, we're waiting uh, for official word on, on who the interim will be. Uh, there is speculation that Eddie Payton will be the interim. So that they have interim. not named not an yet. official interim right. person, but mm -hmm. what's... Getting out there is... It's, yeah, uh, Eddie Payton's name is getting out there in terms of... If that. he happens to be the guy, what are your thoughts on that move? Uh, he's tremendous. Uh, I'll say this about Coach Payton. Uh, he has built up tremendous number of relationships in, in the state of Mississippi. He has been a noted fundraiser, especially for that golf program that is no longer in existence. So you moving back to Jackson? Can you do it full time? <laughs> Uh, I God. know you're not quite finished with the well, right. program, but I, I, you I, are earning a master's of science sports studies sports leadership. I, I would, you know, really jump at that opportunity to try to go back and help B. Um, but uh, like you said, I'm going to finish this master's in this sports leadership program and then see where it takes see me from there. It takes you like that. Yes, indeed. Who are some of the hot names out there that you would say if you were a consultant mm -hmm. and they hired you as the consultant, First of all, what are some names out there? Why are those names, and what do you look in? More importantly, what would you look at and say, this is not only what the director of athletics need to do at Jackson State, but why it would be a good fit? I was always impressed with Melvin Hines at Alabama State, tremendously progressive uh, in terms of some of the things that he was able to do over there, uh, in terms of putting some bills together, things of that nature. I'm tremendously impressed with the bio of Danfia Ford Key at Mississippi Valley State. Uh, a lot yeah. of things that she's done up at Mississippi Valley State that I don't think a lot of people know. Um, we've had um, so you athletic named, directors at Dillard so and Langston both on. Kiki Baker Barnes, Kiki Dr. Baker Kiki Barnes. Baker Barnes. Yes, yes, indeed. Um, so I, I think those are people who, when you hear them, you get really excited so you, about. You believe it's somebody that has some experience. Yes, yes, very much. And has some experience with HBCU programs exactly. as well. Exactly. And, and all say, those individuals have had some success for, uh, either at their current institution exactly. or previous institutions. Exactly. And I'll say this, I think Coach Payton would be a, a great choice as well because Coach Payton, like I said, he, certainly he has success. built up a tremendous resume in terms of some of the things that he's done and corporate contacts and things of that nature. It would be a boon for Coach Payton you know, to be athletic director. The tough question of the day, Dr. Charles McCullen, uh, do you think he'd be a fit, first of all? Tremendously. Yes. Uh, Dr. McClellan, just in watching him here at, at Texas Southern. I don't think you can write checks. Yeah, I, I, you know, it, it would be a tough get, but. And, let, you and, know. and the other thing that you have the issue is we put this on the table last week. Not only do you have the AD position at Jackson State open, but it looks as if you're going to have, if it's not already the case, that the commissioner job right. is coming open. Exactly. So you're also fighting that as well, that you have some of the people you named. As AD may be qualified in positions to look at uh, becoming the commissioner of the SWAC. So how do you deal with that when you're com competing against the next person? The right. I, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great point you make. That's a, a tough, tough deal in terms of when you have a person who obviously would be very qualified to be a commissioner of the Southwestern Athletic Conference or, you know, or have the opportunity or the choice to be athletic director at Jackson State. And to me, that job at Jackson State, uh, the fan base, of course, I grew up in it, but the, the fans are starving for something good, especially with regards to football, uh, even more so, uh, more so football, but basketball definitely as well. But whoever takes the reins of that, they will have a fan base that would be so tremendously behind them that, you know, it, it would be a, a tough, Tough job to pass up. Michael Lee say he gonna put his name in the hat. <laughs> Michael Lee would be a good one too. He say hey, <laughs> he can figure all this out, y'all. Uh, he has some great suggestions. He does. Mm -hmm. He goes in there and does some research. But um, 
Also, I think it's intriguing. What about the Savannah State move from the MEAC to Division Two? We heard about that, but now it's official. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Let me before you get some thoughts sure, on. Go, go, go ahead. I got a question for. Oh, oh. you think I'm gonna let the man from Mississippi off, and you've got Mr. Grant on the on the line? Wait, okay. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I, I mean, uh, I'm on the man from Mississippi. I, I, I think you'd be off. surprised in terms of would would Jackson State be able to open up a checkbook? I, well, Dr. Cavill made that statement. <laughs> I, I didn't make that statement. Dr. Cavill made that statement. <laughs> hey, you know, it, that'd be a tough get to get Dr. Cavill. But, but it could Mississippi happen. Spend a lot of new money in Mississippi. Yeah, it's a little money over there now. Yeah, I know. Uh, about Eddie Payton, give, just give the listeners a little bit more history about Eddie Payton. Now, many people may be listening for the first time. They don't, they don't know the history of this man. Yeah, uh, Coach Payton, uh, of course, played football at Jackson State. He's brother of Walter Payton, uh, lifelong Jackson State Tiger. Uh, he was a deep pockets. Uh, I would say so. Uh, head of the look at doctor. Head of the golf program. Yeah, he and a ball? tremendous number of championships with the golf program. But he is a Jackson State Tiger through and through, and couldn't think of anybody better, you know, who would, you know, really take the reins of this job and really want to push Jackson State up to further heights. Okay, I just wanted, I, you know, I just wanted you to bring it up, Doctor. You got uh, Doctor Grant on. Let me get. See if a good doctor. Make sure you got him all right. He's looking for twenty-five million. John people. Grant. Look oh. at 25 million people watch the game this week. Man, I thought you were going to put his name in the athletic director of the commission. Hey! Could be. Could be. Could be. Could be. Could be. You hear him smile. That wouldn't be a bad thought then. Yeah. Man, John Gray said, I got a job. Boy, y'all, yeah, man, we'll put your hat in there. We look good leadership. Hard to find. He's still laughing. Yeah, he said he's going to touch that one. Hello, good day, John Gray. Thank you for calling in. I'm happy to be with you guys again, and thank you so much for having me. In the midst of just, I was listening and uh, all this hot news that you, they call it hot topic. There you go. Guys are discussing. Um, very, very much, uh, uh, you know, interesting to hear about that. Yeah, it's fascinating. A lot of news going on out there. But the big news that we're talking about is this matchup on Saturday. We'll get back to some of the other news. We got time to do that. But the big news is the matchup that's in Atlanta. This Saturday, 12 o'clock noon Eastern time. That's 11 o'clock for all you folks that haven't made plans to travel down there. You still got time to figure out how you can get in your car and leave on Friday. And you, you can be there in time for the game. But as they say, if you're not there, make sure you turn on the TV and watch it. But uh, before we do any further, let's get in and talk a little bit about this matchup. We have Grambling coming in with one loss after winning le uh, the first game, so they've won 11 straight. a and is undefeated coming out of the MEAC, obviously Grambling out of the SWAC. Both these teams have played and won uh, in the last two years the Celebration Bowl trophy and ultimately the outright HBCU championship as well because of their play in the game. A lot of facts out there that uh, I'll give out uh, in case we don't give one over here. I just want the listeners. I got to talk North about Carolina this. North Carolina here is the favorite by three. Get that out there too. <laughs> 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 well, you know, see, you're going to make our grandma fans Nervous, they over here watching. No, we got Mr. Caleb Mandela. Well, they, he was he interested in the stand you. You he gotta have a line on the game, Doc. He's interested in Mandela. He's game. interested in that Coach Simmons going to fam you. Oh, we're gonna get to that. <laughs> yeah, you gotta have a line on the game, Doc. So Every, over sixty six thousand yeah. in attendance over the last two years, over fifteen point seven million T V viewers watching live on ABC Network. Talk about this week, John Grant. Well, you know, what, is, what an event that we have uh, in front of us. Uh, this is probably one of the greatest matchups in HBCU football history. Um, no doubt you about consider it. The fact that the, you know, the, what, as you mentioned earlier, um, the MEAC uh, reigning uh, champion, North Carolina a and coming in here undefeated with the chance to, um, if they are able to win out, will set a record uh, for the first MEAC team in conference history to have a complete and perfect season. Wow. Uh, and you have Grambling State University coming in with what a tremendous record with one loss early in the season to Temple, but also undefeated in conference, just as North Carolina a and is. Two stellar quarterbacks, two great teams, two great running backs. I mean, I think the matchup is about as even as you could have it. 
in uh, on national television in one of the premier venues in the country uh, with Mercedes-Benz Stadium. What else can we say? Here's what I will say: anyone who chooses to stay home and uh, not make the trip uh, will miss one of the great games in history. Uh, and an opportunity to be a part of that as a fan. So I can tell you that we are excited. The energy around Atlanta is, is wonderful. Grambling just arrived today. Uh, they came in a day early, so they're already in town. Uh, North Carolina a and arrives tomorrow, and the anticipation level for this game is as high as any I've, I've seen. Certainly, and you talk about this matchup uh, in in terms of one, if not the best game of, certainly one of the best matchups between HBCU programs, particularly in the bowl fashion in the season for incredible watch. Let me let Charles jump in here and ask a follow-up question. Well, Mr. Grant, I'm glad we have you on tonight. I had a, uh, a, a lady reach out to me, and she wanted to know the significance of of being the first bowl game to start off bowl season because she was asking, well, why isn't it around New Year's Day? Talk about the significance and the importance of being the first uh, bowl game to really kick off bowl season. Well, you know, we are fortunate in that we have the position to open uh, the college football bowl season. Our game, uh, being in that position, uh, in the last two years, we've had great games that really set the tone uh, from a fan perspective for the season. Uh, when you have two champions uh, meeting up in a game uh, like the Celebration Bowl playing for a national championship, um, which starts the, the bowl season off, uh, it's an enviable position to be in. And it's one that we are not only, as I said, very fortunate to have, but you know, proud to have and uh, are pleased that it is uh, you know, our uh, conferences that, that are, are leading uh, the season. I want you to think about it this way. Um, do you know uh, off the top of your head the most famous reindeer of it, all? It would be Rudolph, huh? And what made Rudolph famous was because he led, he was the leader. Yes, indeed. Uh, <laughs> of, of Santa's reindeer snake. So, uh, you, you know, we sort of equate our position as that. Um, it's important. Every bowl game is important without question. But uh, having the opportunity to set the tone for the bowl season with a championship game and, and then to know that on the other end of the bowl season is another championship game which closes the season. So that, that um, is what creates the significance. Let's talk about some of the – we really talked about the game and the matchups, and I think uh, did a great job. And – Focusing on why that matchup is one that everybody uh, certainly should tune in or be in the stadium to watch. Let's talk about some of the other events. There are a lot of events associated with this game to make sure folks have a good time in Atlanta while they're there. Talk about some of the events uh, that are associated with the game as well. Wow. Well, there are a number of events associated with the bowl aspect and the players uh, aspect. There's a welcome dinner we have for them on tomorrow at the Georgia Aquarium. Um, we have on um, also a relationship with the National Football League uh, that will be um, engaging the players on uh, Thursday morning. Uh, we have a, our Champion Circle event at the College Football Hall of Fame on Thursday night in partnership with the Black College Football Hall of Fame. We're going to have their inductees uh, who will be inducted into the Hall of Fame in February. But when we have like the Greg Lloyd and Everton Walls and Hollywood Henderson and Coach Bill Hayes and others, um, you know, that will be a part of that event, as well as we have the their um, uh, players of the year uh, candidates. Two of them, which are playing in the Celebration Bowl, the Bronte Kincaid from Grambling and um, Savard Raynard out of North Carolina A&T, also candidates for the I'll call it the equivalent of the Heisman. But the, the Deacon Jones Award for the Black College Football Hall of Fame that will be also announced in, in February. Um, our, our fan experience um, uh, happening prior, prior to the game, and then of course kickoff is at noon. But then along with that, there are a number of, of you know uh, events taking place in the city. The SWAC has about three or four events on 
on Thursday, on Friday night, I'm sorry, and then also on Saturday night. And I know that the MEAC fans are also having um, uh, events and venues around town uh, as well on Friday and Saturday night. So big, big weekend. All of our hotel room blocks are sold out. So we know the fans are coming in, but it also means there are other hotels in town. Uh, it's just that our blocks are, are sold, but plenty of hotel rooms in Atlanta for this game. Yeah. So, you know, move away to the city. Um, it's going to be a great event, we, it, without question. And um, if you can't make it, make sure you tune in to watch it uh, on ABC. It is going to be, we believe, as I said, one of the best games uh, in college football this, this season. Certainly. Talk about the ticket sales. How are ticket sales going? Ticket sales are, are thriving. We still have some seats available. Um, but make sure you go to the, the celebrationbowl.com, celebrationbowl.com to get your tickets uh, uh, for this. We, we are still running right now, and we have been, been successful so far. Our Me Plus 3 campaign, which means if you buy four tickets, you get 25% off of each ticket. Uh, and so while that last fans can, can participate in that and, um, and take advantage of the discounts that that offers, uh, again, our Me Plus 3, if you go to the celebrationbowl.com and get tickets, you can still get uh, um, 25% off uh, each ticket when you purchase four. Yeah. Uh, four and beach. Mr. Grant, uh, just talking about the, the matchup again with Grambling and, and, and North Carolina and T. Uh, <laughs> when you have this sort of matchup, uh, how excited are you just as a fan to watch these two teams both ranked in the top 15 in FCS and, and all sorts of polls? Uh, just to, to, to be able to watch uh, Grambling and North Carolina and team, two teams that have uh, been at the top of the MEAC and SWAC proverbially all year. Well, I'm excited because both of them are previous Celebration Bowl national champions. Mm -hmm. uh, and the significance That's pretty cool. of having these two champions um, meet meet again for the championship and to, for the tiebreaker because each of them has, has taken the championship home to their conference. Right. So North Carolina A and T represented the MEAC well in year one and took the took the championship home to the MEAC conference. Last year, Grambling did the same thing in a hard fought game against North Carolina Central and by one point. They took the trophy home uh, to the SWAT conference. So this year, when those same two teams meet up again, uh, representing their conferences, that means that they have that, that, that those young uh, student athletes have put it all on the line throughout the season, have earned the right to be here to represent their conference uh, for this tiebreaker for the national championship. And you know, we could not have expected this any better than what we have uh, for this year's game. Excitement, absolutely. Um, and hopefully the same exists for you guys out there in, in, you know, in the media who have an opportunity to, to um, talk about, um, uh, you know, as I said, one of the great matchups probably in the history of ACC football. No doubt about it. Yeah, I'm looking for I'm excited looking about it. it. Exactly. And like I said, I, I we fly out tomorrow. Mm -hmm. yes. So we're ready to take part and make sure we get the information out. We're doing a live broadcast that morning to make sure folks feel like, uh, particularly for those that are going to watch it, uh, that they can feel like they're there. And obviously getting those that are in the city and getting up for the hotels after having probably a great time Friday night, we're going to get them ready uh, for that game Saturday morning. With that, what are the various ways that people can check out the game? Obviously, they can be in Atlanta. We talked about the tickets, briskly going. So if you're going to be in Atlanta, you need to make sure you go ahead and grab onto your tickets now So and don't wait uh, for, the, uh, for the last part of the game because it is liable to get to the point where they sold out. So go ahead and get them now. Also, what about those that are watching, that have an opportunity to watch? How can they watch or listen to the game? Well, uh, um you certainly can tune in on ABC um, at, at uh, noon Eastern, 11 o'clock Central. Um, it, I think, again, being on network television, we're one of three games, bowl games, to be on network television also speaks volume uh, for this bowl game and, 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 and certainly gives our fans across the country an opportunity to, you know, to watch this, even if you don't have cable, you can live on network TV. So tune in on your, on your ABC uh, network channel at 12 o'clock Eastern, 11 o'clock uh, Central. Um, and certainly 
um, it's important to tune in. I love the fact that you guys are going to be broadcasting uh, pre-game down here and bringing, bringing it to SWAC fans and your fans, you know, across the country as well. So just really excited about that. Yeah, and we're going to go, as you said, we're going to talk about the matchup. We'll touch on it a little bit then, but we're going to save, as they say, save a lot of that. We're going to go inside the numbers on Saturday. Mm -hmm. So we're going to tell you, with a lot of these folks that are talking about the matchup, giving their uh, numbers of what they talk about the games, point spreads and all that, we're going to go inside the numbers, tell you about players to watch, uh, both those on watch lists for awards, those that have already received awards, like Ken K won the Ben L. Calvert Senior HBCU Football Award that's uh, tied to a player connected with the state of Texas. He's already taken that trophy away. Obviously, we'll talk about the SWAC and MEAC uh, players of the years, those associated that are playing in this game. And then we'll talk about some players to watch on the next level. So we'll go in, side the numbers, and give you some uh, statistical analysis of certain players from both teams, uh, make sure you know what to watch out for. So we're really excited about that. Well, I know that you were here for our press conference um, this past week. And Wouldn't have missed it. The in interesting thing is I'm sitting here looking at this national championship trophy. You <laughs> had a chance to um, to um, see it. Uh, the ones that the, that the winner will take home. That's right. It is a piece of hardware. Uh, and I know without question that um, uh, both teams are eager to be the ones to hoist this, this piece of hardware up as national champion this year. But my expectation is when I when I tune into you guys' show, I don't hear anything other than the celebration mode. It's the hottest news out there right now. Oh, <laughs> don't worry about that Saturday. That's all yes, that's good. <laughs> that is the name of the game that morning. We're going inside. Like I said, it's all about the numbers that day. <laughs> and and um, certainly, you know, like you said, being here and, and seeing what this event is about, as you guys have, you have a firsthand experience and feel. And it's hard to translate that sometimes to fans. But until you've been to one. Yeah, and, right. Uh, Bucket and list. And that, that has been here, that's been to one, regardless of what school that they are. You know, I've talked to a lot of um, fans from all corn who, who were in the first game. But they, you know, they, they came back year two, and they're coming back year three just because of the energy around the event. North Carolina Central fans, even though they didn't make it back this year, the team didn't. They're coming back in numbers as well because of the just the excitement of being at a bowl game. The energy and the magic about a bowl game is something, but about a bowl game for HBCU pride between the MEAC and SWAC with the history between both conferences, you can't describe it. Unmatched, right. You have to be in the house to partake on it. And as I said, these are one of the things that you want on the bucket list. It's just so exciting to me that I actually pencil this into my schedule, negotiate it all with the wife, whether she comes like the last two years this time, uh, she had other things, obligations, but she already knew that it wasn't a problem. Her husband, <laughs> the one and over, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, and all those I can drag with me, right. we in Atlanta, and we jump it off Wednesday when it gets started. And, and the way things are going, they talking about adding different events. We're going to have to come out there early. So I negotiated that with the classes. Uh, my students already had their final exams. All that is checked off, grades in. I have nothing to worry about but to partake in the Celebration Bowl starting tomorrow. So for you that are out there listening, um, I want you to you, you know think about what you just heard from Dr. Cavill and everything that he's done uh, to be here. And certainly I want to thank you for that. You've been, you guys have been great supporters. But it's more... I think you, you're great supporters not only for what this event is, but because you, you've seen it, you've touched it, you've yeah. been with it, you've experienced it. And you've experienced it from, from uh, the first year, and we've done nothing but get better. Yes. Um, this event's going to be better than last year because we got you know we got new toys to play with. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. we got a $1.5 billion toy to play with this year. Mm -hmm. And I want to thank you that in meeting with them and what – what they're uh, uh, allowing us to do and what the experienced fans will have, people who were not here are going to say, wow, I wish I had been here. So, you know, that, that, that's pretty much what we can say. It's going to be a great game, no question about it. That's right. The experience of the Celebration Bowl, the experience of being a fan uh, at the Celebration Bowl is second to none. Certainly. The ups yes, and downs, the pageantry, right. the bands, 
uh, the introduction, the closing, all of it are things that you want to touch. The tailgate before, the pregame celebrations, all those things are quite fabulous in terms of uh, being a part of this. And as you said, I got to touch it. No longer will I miss it. Uh, and, and, and I did. I did want to add one more thing because we didn't talk about this, and we have to talk about this, and that is our halftime show. You know, um, North Carolina A and T and uh, Grambling State University, according to our uh, undefeated uh, official um, ranking, rank in the top ten bands. Um, it you know in in the country. So that's a that fierce being, battle itself, we right? Have a matchup uh, on the football field. But this is going to be a, uh, I'll call it a knockdown drag out at halftime as well, because both of these bands are, are have, have, have communicated to us that they've raised their game for this event. Um, so they've made special preparation for their participation in uh, this year's Celebration Bowl. And I can't wait to see what each of them do uh, at halftime. They, they both put together special shows um, for this, for this uh, championship game. That's absolutely right. John, we appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to come on and mix it up with us and give us some insight on the uh, Celebration Bowl, one of the first places you can get it. So we appreciate you doing that, and we look forward to seeing you in Atlanta and saying hello. Thank you, guys, and I appreciate it. Can't wait to see you. Thank you, Ms. Graham. All right. Take care. Thank you. We're going to take a time out, and then we'll come right back Mix up, and so this is Dr. Caville's inside the HBCU Sports Lab. KKBQ HD. Any updates with uh, two minutes? About two minutes. Nothing. Let's see what we got. You sent him a number. Neither one. I gave him my, my number to uh, to call, but he's one of the top ones. That, that camera's working. It wasn't working at first, but that camera's on. Between eight and nine a.m. Hi, this is Ben Hall. Host of the Ben Hall Legal Hour, the show where life meets the law, where the confusing legal system is made a little system. more understandable. Okay. Attorney Ben Hall is still a board certified in both so personal injury law and civil trial law. Like our accomplishment achieved by less than one percent of Texas attorneys. The Hall Law Firm, where lawyers are from the top of the list, seven one three nine four two ninety six hundred. Well, you know what I'm going to do. Nine four two ninety six hundred. North Carolina is the favorite. The white boys won't do it. I talked to them. Oh, yeah. They won't do it. They said they don't have a line on the game. Is in session. So I said, well, if you this is a little too much. I said probably three. You go to North Carolina. You can't do too much more than that. Right. Hey, it's Ed Gordon. Join me on the game. Because last year the game went down. What, 10 to 9? Jerry P. Beasley, Monday through Friday. 10 to 9. 10 to 9, Grambling over North Carolina. Yep. So I did my homework. Here we go. You can't go past those two points. No, it's going to be a good one. You spend more time with your family. Feeling relaxed when you get to work and improving our air and traffic. Road Warriors for Smarter Commutes do all this and more. You can too. Carpool, vanpool, bus, bike, or rail. Try something new one day a week. It can be the best thing that ever happened to your commute. Visit findasmarterwayofwork.org. Brought to you by Commute Solutions, a program of the Houston Galveston Area Council. Hello, this is Ralph Cooper encouraging you to use the Dawson Chemical and Janitorial Supplies Company for all of your chemical and janitorial supplies. They're located at 6010 Irvington. They make deliveries. Remember, they can help you with all of your chemical and janitorial supplies. That's the Dawson Chemical and Janitorial Supplies Company, 6010 Irvington, Houston, Texas, H-Town. You can give them a call also at 713-697-7137, 713-697-7137, the Dawson Chemical Company, the home of champions. KCOH-TV is the only station where you can find okay, the legendary radio personality, playwright, director, and producer, Jerry P. Beasley. What time is Simmons calling? Inspired, inspired, and laughing. Check her out Monday through Friday on the Keep the Morning Moving Morning Show at 6 a.m. and on Sundays on the difference from sounded good. I'm looking at it on, there, the on my phone. In the air. Cool. And listen to it. This is Dr. Phil with Inside the HBC Sports Lab with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. Mike Washington is trying to get to the studio and he didn't turn on the live video. He's getting it in. <laughs> Chad and him are going back and forth talking about let's go inside the numbers. Put the pom pom down. Boy, they they going at it big. That's now, I like it. what DT Green said. Forget all the talk who's going to promise something. Let's get it popping. Yeah, that's what's Pop it's, those pads we, we and the hell, let's, let's get it in there. Ernest Smithers say, what's up, Fred? I hear you. 
Uh, so uh, Brian Bearfield is in the house, Don Morris. We also have a report from Michael Lee that says that you have um, Edward Waters making a hire. In fact, they have hired tight ends coach Greg Ruffin as head coach. He's been here at Texas Southern, Jackson originally State. from Jackson State. Yeah. Uh, he coached at Texas College. He brought back Bain College. This would be an interesting move. Mm -hmm. He certainly had a chance to revive programs and take them to the next level. This is this is probably a pretty good move in terms yeah, of Edward Waters, yeah. Greg what Ruffin, he can get uh, done. He's a heck of a ball, football coach. Uh, also, Michael Lee, is, he's putting it all out there. He said, rumors are South Carolina State may be leaving the MEAC and dropping to D2 after Pew's one-year extension. I thought that was intriguing that he just got a one-year extension, and so maybe that's the tangle of what's going on. We've heard over the last couple of years that because of the enrollment numbers and what the state is doing to them financially, yeah. that they're trying to figure out can they maintain operating at the Division One FCS level uh, and should they consider moving down. I wonder what the move with Savannah State returning uh, to the SIAC, mm -hmm. uh, as they announced by the president, which, again, was a year-long uh, statement that was made this past summer, really. Uh, but they won't start playing in 2018, as well as Hampton, supposedly, is not going to start playing at least football until 2018. So it'll be interesting to see what the MEAC will look at in a couple of years, particularly with this with South Carolina State. Also, some big news out there with the SIAC is they have – sign an exclusive deal, as they like to say it, from head to toe yes. with Nike. Nike. Mm. And so that is a big deal for the SIEC fans out there and the teams and potential current players, obviously, and potential recruits in terms of Nike. So it'll be interesting to follow up that. We'll see if we can get Commissioner Greg Moore on in the next couple of weeks maybe to talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. um, he gave me a little heads up as I talked to him. Uh, Thursday when I was down there in Atlanta for the press conference, called him. He was in New York, so it's, uh, it's my understanding that he was working on closing out that deal mm -hmm. as well as making sure everything went right with Savannah State. So how, how does that sort of work when, uh, in terms of apparel companies approaching? Uh, uh, it can go either way. You have representatives that are oftentimes looking for deals of how they can put their clothing line out there on certain market segments that they like, obviously, we know the bigger ones where they go after a school institution, mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, Texas, uh, in some cases, Oregon, obviously. Then you got the brand Jordan, which is a subsidiary of Nike, but has its own uh, marketing component. Mm -hmm. And so, obviously, they went out uh, after uh, Michigan was a big deal. I think now they have North Carolina. And if I'm not mistaken, they jumped back and got somebody else here in the south, south southwest area. So that's kind of intriguing. Uh, Adidas. Uh, gets in there. Obviously, we talked about Adidas and Louisville, which has caused some problems in terms of what's going on there. But all these companies are looking about how do they put their brand and connect with another brand such that they can increase sales is what they're trying to do. So, the, so in this case, with the SIEC, I think what's unique, which is the previous model from essentially MEAC and SWAC, where you take all your schools and sign a conference-wide deal. Mm -hmm. Oddly enough, the SWAC is moving away from that. To right. some degree, the MEAC kind of opened it up several of the schools, three of the 13, and that's the th 13 as currently standing, and about 10 of them uh, decided to sign a deal essentially uh, w with one company. Uh, I think it was Nike is certainly the shoe components of it, and I think Nike provides a lot of the other uh, apparel as well. So the question that I got that they wanted to ask you is, uh, are the schools paying the apparel company or is it, are the apparel companies paying the school for the right to wear? It can be both ways. Okay. Uh, it depends on the deals. It can be in kind. Oftentimes what you will get is the, particular at the next level after the Power Five. Power Five, they outright pay the schools, and it's some ridiculous sums of money. Mm -hmm. It can be 10 years, $50 million. Uh, I think Texas signed one not too long ago. It was like 10 years, $100 million or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so you have those levels. As you start to drop down in terms of what people would call brand recognition, if you would, in terms of the institution, uh, you start doing these conference deals. The 140 SWAC, to give you a particular example, is the Russell deal would give them some finance up front, mm -hmm. give them forty, thirty-five, forty thousand $40,000, uh, and then they would say that they would sell, have them buy, but they would get it by what they call retail market, or what's in the book price, which is supposed to be a reduction. Mm -hmm. Some people questioning how much of it was in terms of reduction of cost. Uh, but they would allocate and said that you would get 
uh, $150,000 in retail merchandise and thing, anything above that cost you would buy at a reduced rate. Wow, okay. So in that case, it's more like an in-kind. Sure. And But you could pick out what you want, and you would get that every so often. And so essentially you would get these new uniforms, the swag, doing different uh, teams. Uh, and anything for that Russell deal, anything that Russell did not make, then you could go sign or get somewhere else out another deal. So uh, we'd have to go look really in the details of the contract to get there from the SIC. Mm -hmm. Use that at that level. They don't put that kind of stuff out there, so you'd have to have really good relationships <laughs> with folks to get it. And some of that is because we're so critical as fans right. uh, because we believe that our brand should be worth more than that. Not to say that we shouldn't really negotiate try to negotiate maybe better deals. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if you don't have anything to compare it with or if you don't have the numbers to get started, sometimes you may think your worth uh, is bigger than what somebody is willing to pay. Sure. And that's where you get these scenarios. We have Master Caleb Mandela on. Uh, Chad says Gramlin is going to destroy John Grant's Eagles. I think John Grant is an ag exec. Oh, he did update it. So he thinks he's a little biased. Trust me, all John Grant wants is a great game. Dwight Moore is on Langston English. He's another Aggie chiming in. He's, he's, he's booked and ready to go to Atlanta. He was already booked regardless of the Eagles, Aggies game. And he said he just he wanted the Aggies to win, but he was going regardless. I see you laughing at uh, Chad there. <laughs> and so we got Mike in here watching, talking about he's still trying to get from uh, Baytown. Chad says the score will be Gramlin 35, A&T 17. Oh, no way. Chad. Let's put some money on that one, Chad. Oh, Chad. Don't yeah. do me like that. <laughs> there's no way there's going to be the 35, score. 35, 7. Okay. Oh, yeah, we, we put all kinds of – I won't even go on television and say what – I mean on the mic, so we can put on that, Chad. Let me know what you want to put at, what you want to lose. We'll get that on there. Not that Gramlin won't win, but it's, it, it will not be 35, 17. Yeah, I'm looking for a slug for us. That's, that's it. Well, we'll get into it, but I, I'm looking for uh, a real close one Saturday. That's he said we're going to rename the game after Gramlin. <laughs> <laughs> Wendell Webster's on here. <laughs> oh, so Mike boy. and Chad are going back and forth. Jimmy, what's up, Jimmy? I'm here. Let's get into some more of these coaching certs. Obviously, it's finally been announced. Uh, Seem probably like the worst kept secrets, particularly at the end of the last week. Mm -hmm. Willis Simmons has been uh, announced, or certainly in terms of Prairie View side, said they appreciated him on Saturday. So mm -hmm. it would make everybody believe that he's uh, gone to FAMU. Uh, my understanding from a Twitter site, they did welcome Willis, uh, Coach Willis Simmons to FAMU. Mm -hmm. uh, so now I guess uh, when I talk to him, I got to go, go Rattlers. Hey, Rattlers, strike, strike, and strike again. You got to give it to him. <laughs> <laughs> he got that money, didn't he? Yes, You'll he You'll be did. wrong once again. <laughs> uh, Please put the GSU pom-poms down. Mike is telling. He said the line has has gone down. They have A&T by nine points favorites in the matchup. Ralph had it by three. So he said there's some lines out there with nine points. Interesting. Anything else? Any other hot news while I'm looking at some of these updates? Michael Lee says at Jimmy, 33-24, Grambling. That's interesting, 33-24. Yeah, I, I like that. But let's uh, take a look around uh, a little bit. Uh, let's jump off into a little bit of basketball. Uh, Alcorn State's Revenue Johnson, he broke his leg, and he was preseason uh, SWAC Player of the Year. Uh, Johnson is 6'5", 250-pound forward, and he averaged 16 points last year. So a big blow to the Alcorn State Brave basketball team. Of course, after the Celebration Bowl, we'll you know, start getting into a, a little bit more basketball and whatnot, um, really starting to get that basketball up and going. Texas Southern, impressive showing last night against uh, Oregon. Uh, really took Oregon to the mat last night. Uh, you had Jackson State with an out-of-conference victory over Fist, 60-53. to 53. Score was a little bit surprising to quite a few people. And uh, DePaul uh, beat uh, Alabama A&M 83 59 That was in the swag last night. MEAC had some uh, honors today to go out to uh, some of their uh, basketball players and Pull that up for you real quick. Uh, R.J. Cole, uh, he was earned Rookie of the Week for uh, Howard. Howard with another. Looks like they're going to have another uh, nice basketball team. You take a look around the MIAC. Uh, you had uh, uh, Hampton's Trevon Barnes. He was named Defensive Player of the Week. You also had Marcus Barnes. He was the MIAC uh, 
Player of the Week. Uh, Barham, he a averaged about 25.5 points over two game spans, shot 63% from the field, and he was also 12 of 20 from the three-point line. Huge game against North Florida Monday night. So that was some of the, kind of the action around basketball. Like I said, after we get through Celebration Bowl, and we got a lot to get through with Celebration Bowl, it'll be hot and heavy with basketball. Well, certainly. Uh, any big wins thus far that, that you're excited about in basketball before we get back into the football? I'm trying to – I'm trying to – there there was uh, – it's escaping me right now, huge win um, on the MEAC side of the ball. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm not, that's escaping me over there on that side of the ball. But you you had a, a couple of decent showings, I think, on the MEAC side of the ball. And, you know, Coach Davis with that impressive showing last night against Oregon, I think, you know, everybody's kind of rounding into shape once we get through these Christmas holidays and we start conference play in January. It's going to start to get fun here. So. Let's go back on here and talk about some of the – Posts and updates. BJ Jones says Savannah State should do well in the SIEC. Uh, Mike said big move for the SIEC to land Savannah State because they were looking at a different place but decided to come back home as a lot of people allude to the fact that there's the Savannah State was sucking before they joined the MEAC. He said, they, <laughs> I guess he believes they're going to continue. We got Trey Jones on here. Well, yeah, that should be fun to see. Andrew Earl, is, big Earl. Go is ahead. there another team that's going to really – Stephanie Hawthorne. You know, go heads up with Tuskegee over there in the SIC. So that was when I saw Savannah State moving to the to the SEAC. I was like, okay, let's 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 see if Tuskegee might have a little little bit of a competition, so to speak, over there in the SEAC. Got Eric, uh, Eric Caver. Hope I pronounced that right. That's K-A-V-E-R chiming in from Bahama State is in the house. Chad Jones say, let's do it. No more to talk about it. <laughs> Chad, look BJ Jones said, too many points. I told you, it's just too many points. I know you, points, you're a lot of fans. 30. I don't know if you watch a lot of MEAC football. That defense is for real. All oh, that defense. Um, for the Aggies. They go uh, eight, uh, eight deep, although I've heard they, they have a, a couple of injuries along the defensive line, but they're too big and fast. And then their secondary. Secondary is young, but I tell you what, they make – uh, plays it's, it's going to be a, a fun matchup because you're talking about a, a Aggie offense. Yeah, you're talking about a young uh, defensive back for the Aggies yeah. and young wide receivers. Young wide receivers uh, for the Grambling State Tigers exactly. in regards to that, unlike what we saw last year, where they had receivers that literally could just. Right. It, it would have been fun to see uh, Chad Williams and those guys going up against this uh, this Aggie defense, but. Be it as it is, I think Grandma still has quite a bit of firepower to go against this uh, North Carolina ANT defense. I mean, the defensive line, that's going to be fun. That's, that's I, I think, and we'll get into it Saturday, but that's a matchup that you, you, uh, Grambling has to be prepared for in terms of how physical they are. And I, and I went back and watched ANT play an FBS team in Charlotte, and it was eye-opening to watch how physical they were against the FBS team. So I think they had like seven sacks or something in that game. So, uh, you know, Gremlin, they, they've got to bring their lunch pail Saturday. Yeah, they got to be able to work in the trenches. And they, they had the ability to do it, but I don't think it's just going to be one of those cakewalk type things. Also, we have Michael D. Jones. What's up, guys, in the house? Appreciate you having you join it. Varick Williams uh, on it. KC Price. He said, the score made surprise. Being off a month can be a good or a bad thing. That's yeah. right. I certainly agree with that because you get to re recover from your injuries, but if you're not careful, you uh, you ha you can be a little rusty. Uh, I like what Coach said about this. Coach Broadway, you know, he's been in business a long time. He said, well, he said, I asked that question actually during the press conference. He said, well, I'll tell you after the game. If we win, it was good. <laughs> it was bad. Um, so he said, you know, he understands that it goes both ways. But he has the experience to find ways – in the past and judge his team a while the tempo and what to do mm -hmm. to kind of make sure his team is ready so obviously you could be rusty but something tells me that that won't be the case they may be a little slow in that but i don't think it'll take them very long to get in the game mode in regards to what's going on there yeah, i've had a few grandma people text me and it was like coach broadway can't win the big one i'm like huh <laughs> where are we going where are we going because it seems and i, I think what? it was 2013 uh, NT beat Appalachian State. You know, you you had some, what? How do you define I, I, big ones? I mean, I, that's why I'm like, okay, he's won everywhere he's been. Okay, whatever. But the White you know. Morris chimed in. He said, Chad Jones, you need to put that cup of wild turkey down. <laughs> 
Yes, indeed. I tell you what. <laughs> Michael, Michael said, he said, I told you three weeks ago that you're going to be looking for a coach. You say, uh, who's your new coach? They told me not to say yet. I know who it is, and he's already signed. They're just going to wait to announce it. Did wow. I say too much? <laughs> wow. <laughs> I tell you what. These Jimmy Wilson said, leave fun. Chad alone. He's just a fan. He said, I'll be quiet. He said, I'll be quiet until Saturday. Uh, no, he said, thir no, Michael Lee, I stand corrected. I apologize. He said uh, it is 33-24 Aggies. He says the Aggies uh, will get it done. I wonder if he's talking about the trenches like us or does he see another angle in regards to why he's picking the Aggies. Maybe he'll get a chance to chime in while we're going through some of the other people. Casey Price says, tell, I'll tell you what, we're defending champions and they will have to take it convincingly if they want it. Well, I certainly agree with that, Casey Price. In this game, nobody's going to give this up easily. This right. is going to be an excellent played game. You're going to have two top teams coming out there, very hungry, very experienced. I don't see a lot of problems in terms of disciplinary. No. Fact. I think no. these are going to be very sound teams, right. and that's why I believe it's going to be a little closer than what you think. And uh, you'll have to wait till Saturday. At this point, I'm going to say pick them uh, just so I can hopefully get y'all to turn in Saturday as we go in. And <laughs> yeah, I think the Kimberly uh, Washington is, is watch. My oh. sister there, uh, Chad Jones is saying this is going. He did say it's going to be a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, got somebody else, Trey Jones. What's up, fellas? Graham f for the win, 24-21. I think that's much more closer the indication of what I would think. I could see that yeah. uh, easily. Um, Bertrand Simmons. Bert Simmons says TSU is playing without Scott, and he is one of their best players. I guess he's saying Gramley GSU. Oh, he's talking about basketball. Yes, they are playing with Scott. He had well under view uh, some knee uh, examinations, so hopefully they get him back. But you're right. He certainly is one of the best players. Not only that, he's experienced and understands what Mike wants. Kevin Scott. And he's been in the position to get the championship, so he helps tie everybody else together. Mm -hmm. So losing him for a couple of games was big in that estimation. It'll be interesting to see uh, if he's able to get back this season. B.J. Jones says all these Aggies have All-Americans secondary, uh, and so those are some of the things we got there. Let's get back into some other news. Any other hot news out there that uh, we need to talk about? Obviously, we had the announcement. With Alabama State keeping Eli Hill, yes, yes, uh, in terms of that move, basically I think it was a two-year deal. Mm -hmm. uh, but you still have Alabama A and M, Pine Bluff out there, right? Mississippi Valley Mississippi in terms Valley. of what they're looking at, right. Delta State, mm -hmm. uh, in regards to their moves and any thoughts in terms of what's going to go on in that. Well, I, of course, I think the the huge uh, hot name that they are, everybody's talking about on social media is Eric Dugan. You know, uh, where where will he go uh, post-Celebration uh, Bowl? I think he's one of the hotter assistants in the Southwestern Athletic Conference. But uh, UAPB put out a list, and they had a lot of interesting names on that list. They have uh, – Yeah, people that we've heard about. Right, it, people that we've heard people, about. People yeah. – uh, want to get back in the business. Right. Uh, actually, some pretty solid names out yeah, there. Very much so, so they have some tough choices to make in terms of who they think will be a good fit uh, for Pine Bluff at this time. It'll be interesting to see uh, what they want and what direction they would go. Uh, and that tells you a little bit about Pine Bluff. You know, people kind of talk down a little bit, but uh, they got some interesting candidates and think that you can get some things done at Pine Bluff. And I guess a lot of that goes to the fact that they, over the last 10 years, they did win a championship. You yeah. find a quarterback. They're in, in the mix, and they find a way. They beat Jackson State. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just five years ago. I see that you remember <laughs> the date now. Well, yeah, cover one. Yeah. Yeah. Receiver got behind the safety. I, yeah. What about some of the assistant coaches' moves uh, in regards to what's going on? Well, yeah, uh, uh, and this is huge news coming out of Jackson. Uh, Chad Germany, uh, he also uh, will be leaving Jackson State's program. Uh, he was the offensive coordinator this past year, of course. Demoted mid-year of Jackson State's offense. Uh, quite honestly, it was uh, near, at the bottom, not just in, in in FCS but Division Two as well. Really struggled offensively this past year. Uh, coach Germany finished up the season, uh, quarterbacks coach and whatnot. But he's leaving Jackson State's program. Uh, you had a lot of you know pom pom waving about that, but in reality, you know he is a heck of a recruiter and he does a tremendous job of recruiting South Louisiana, Baton Rouge, and especially New Orleans. Uh, he was able to get Jackson State uh, quite a few kids from 
uh, some, some good programs down there in the New Orleans area. Edna Carr comes to mind uh, in terms of some of the guys that he was able to get there. But scuttlebutt around Jackson is uh, how Mummy could be uh, uh, named a new offense coordinator, and we'll just kind of wait and see uh, in regards to that. Of course, Hal Mummy, former head coach at uh, Kentucky and the SEC, of course, he's known as a uh, offensive guru with that air raid offense and whatnot. Uh, spent the past few seasons at, at Bell Haven in Jackson, and he had just recently retired. So it could be Johnny on the spot in terms of getting right back into the football business. Yeah, really intriguing there. Uh, colleague here looks at doing these PBAMU holiday orna ornaments. So we'll give you some information on for those that uh, want these ornaments, how to contact him. Uh, look actually pretty nice to put on your Christmas tree mm. for those Prairie View fans out there. I wonder if he has uh, different schools out there as well. That might be something to get into. Let's see what else we got. Uh, Jimmy talking about NFL prospects at A&T defensive lineman. We'll go over that certainly Saturday, take you inside the trenches and inside the numbers. <laughs> uh, Michael Lee say uh, Grambling barely beat uh, Southern with a bunch of freshmen. Boy, I tell you what, those Jags, they hard on grandma. That's fun. Vegas <laughs> has uh, GSU plus nine in the matchup. Mm. Uh, Tina is in here. Good evening, gentlemen. Certainly. Good to have you there. <laughs> Kara said, this is not Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> VJ Joe said, it must be another Vegas. These folks are hilarious. Uh, so it's been pretty interesting in terms of just looking at going inside those numbers. Talk about a little bit. In regards to the offensive side of the Grambling, what do they bring to the table? We don't have to go into the numbers, but we can talk about in terms of when when you watch them, what are the things that excite you about Grambling? Well, uh, they're young receivers. Uh, there hasn't been too much drop-off from NFL prospects from last year. Uh, Devontae Lindsay, uh, I, we're, we're talking about uh, Devontae Kincaid, I should say, who uh, has really led this offense this past year. And they, they're, I was... I don't know if I was expecting a drop. Well, I was. I was expecting a little bit of drop off from uh, the receiving standpoint. But I tell you what, when you have playmakers out wide and Martez Carter especially, he's got to have a huge game Saturday. Can uh, he have a huge game against that that line? I think. He, or I, I think uh, what you're going to have to do is get him outside uh, the defensive ends and whatnot. Get him. Get him in space, uh, much like we saw with Tariq Cohen uh, two years ago in the Celebration Bowl uh, in terms of uh, getting him out in space. But he he did it all. He was running. Yeah, I was going to say he the tackles, tackles too. as well. But he reminds you so much of Tariq Cohen, who's, of course, having a tremendous uh, rookie season with Chicago Bears. And Martez Carter brings a lot of that same energy. He can catch the ball out of the backfield. One-on-one uh, -on -one with linebackers is unfair, you know, and, and – to, to a certain extent with safeties as well. He's just that much of a threat for Grandma. So, uh, A&T has got to be on guard with a clone of Terry Cohn. Certainly. Uh, we'll go back and look a little bit uh, in terms of the Aggies' offense. We talked a little bit about their defense, but we'll go a little more in there. But before I do that, shout out to Roger Gibson, fraternity brother there, showing up, showing out. Uh, Michael D. Jones said he's a swag guy. But he's uh, amazing with the score here. He said 42-10, uh, North Carolina A&T. <laughs> <laughs> Spoken like a true Alkanite. <laughs> Swat guy, boy, I tell you. Hey, if you hate those your friends, I hate to have interviews. have them as interviews, I tell you what. <laughs> Tina says it's going to be a defensive battle. I think uh, there's a lot to be said for that, particularly the first half. Something tells me both teams will make adjustments and maybe play a little looser and open it up mm -hmm. in the second half and you'll get a bit of a uh, bit more scoring. But I certainly wouldn't be surprised in that first half if it's certainly a defensive battle with uh, few scores between the teams other than maybe some big plays here and there. Mm -hmm. But great point, Tina, in regards to talking about the defensive battle in this matchup. And, and before we get into defense, obviously you're talking about Grambling's defense. But before you focus on that, let's talk a little bit about the Aggies' offensive side of the ball. Right. A lot of people look at the Aggies and they tend to think defense. But this year, this team can play some offensive football. And not only do they do it from pounding the ball, which is usually what you're looking for in an Aggie team, particularly under um, Coach Broadway. But in this particular matchup, what they're able to do throwing the ball has opened up a lot of things for them offensively, and you've seen it all year. Talk about the Aggies' offense. Well, I, I think well at the beginning of the year, it caught us by surprise to see 
Lamar Reynard with these 300-yard games when that hasn't been the identity of, uh, of North Carolina a and And he has a target in Elijah Bell. Uh, Elijah Bell, a huge target. Big plays. Big play hands. receiver, uh, fast, yeah. big. You know, and that's the thing that you'll notice about North Carolina a and across the board. Uh, big receivers, uh, huge physical offensive line. Brandon Parker will be uh, easily uh, go within the probably the top five rounds, uh, probably top three uh, in the NFL. Uh, he is a guy who has not given up a sack. So you're talking about uh, uh, an offense that – is explosive, but they still maintain that that MIAC identity where they can just beat you up. And they have a running back who, who uh, uh, all MIAC again for this past season, Marquette Cartwright. Uh, you're talking about an offense that, uh, for for me, I think Gremlin, they have to jump out fast because uh, this defense is a little bit like, or, or I should say, uh, North Carolina NT's defense is a little bit like an anaconda. They just squeeze you to death eventually. So uh, it's going to be fun to really watch uh, the the game within the game, the, the offense, defense line. There there are so much similarities with both. I think that it's going to be fun just to be a fan watching it. Uh, Tina also jumped in there and gave some more about the X factor of Jordan Jones. I think uh, make a great point there in terms of that matchup. Roderick said seventeen Gramlin A and T twenty four. Mike Prince is watching. It'll be interesting to get his scoring here as he can break down the game like none other. Uh, Dooley is a lock for PV. Mm. So Chad. Chad just knows all this great. Yeah, we're we gonna have stuff. to. We're gonna have to put we him. We're gonna have to put him <laughs> on the payroll. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure he comes here first to get all the news out uh, there. Him and B.J. Jones, well, they, are, they stay on it. <laughs> they stay on it. Good <laughs> job uh, for getting in. Thanks for passion on And I think uh, uh, you're on to something there. I'll put it that way. Casey Pry, I look to see a vintage Kincaid Saturday. He certainly had plenty of time to rest, and you know he's going to leave it all out there. He has made it to a point to stay in the pocket, but I feel he will let it go uh, for his finale. Uh, that's, that's not a good one. The UAV is transparent. He said that is good. Tina is talking about UAPB. Uh, certainly need programs that are transparent. Those days where you try to do things behind the scene uh, as ADs will get you in trouble. <laughs> uh, Antoinette said, but the Jags couldn't beat all courts. The boy, they throw a slug out here. <laughs> Chuck Houston in here, Varick Williams. Uh, will Gramlin O-line be able to block a and uh, Chad Jones uh, was questioning for Chad Jones. Curly Cup is in here. Uh, Houston Oiler, a and Aggie getting in here. He's ready for this matchup. Mr. Cup. Mr. Cup, yes, Hall of Famer. Hall of That's Famer. NFL Hall of exactly. Famer, Mr. Coley Cup. I appreciate you chiming in last couple of weeks. Like I said, we're ready to get you on. Let us know when you want to get an interview and talk about your college experience is what we really want to get into. Uh, a lot of people have heard about the NFL. We'll talk about that a little bit. We want to go back to those days when you were – uh, down on the campus mm. uh, and, and talk about how those days were uh, back then. That would be exciting to hear. Uh, Trey Jones said a and hasn't seen the athletes Graham has all over the field. That's an interesting viewpoint. That, you know. I, I certainly think you can make that argument right. that uh, the talent in terms of Gremlin has and can put on you is going to be different. Uh, but uh, I think Aggies have some uh, players themselves. Right. Uh, 60 Minutes of Tiger Payne, John A. Waitman said. <laughs> Monique A. from Virginia, Monique Smith out there. Good to have you on here. Anthony Mullins will have a big game on defensive side of the ball. Uh, also, depends where he lines up. Because if he's over there on Brandon Parker's side, that's going to be a long day. Now, But, <laughs> again, the offensive line for North Carolina NT, not only Brandon Parker, but the, the offensive guard beside him. The name escapes me right now. But they're both all MEAC, and uh, they say he is the next NFL uh, 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 draft prospect in waiting for a &T. So, it, I tell you what, Grandma's defensive line, they got their uh, hands full Saturday. But you know what? They proved me wrong all season. I thought there was going to be a drop-off. Chad, has, let's, let's, let's has get into this. Out, Since so. y'all done got me all excited and fired <laughs> up. I'm just going to take it out of here. you talking about that offense because you keep talking about this line. We got left tackle, and this is the projected starting uh, depth chart. It's Brandon Parker, 6'7", 309-pound senior from Kannapolis, North Carolina. Left guard, uh, 61, is Joshua Patrick, 6'3", 331, redshirt senior. Center is 72, Daryl Mack, 6'2", 293-pound redshirt uh, senior. 
And then right tackle is a number 73, Marcus Pettiford, in terms of his 6'3", 274-pound. And he's the underclassman on the line as a redshirt sophomore. But you have four seniors on this line, with the tight end being uh, Leroy Hill, 6'3", 249, redshirt junior. Well, you're talking about a lot of experience uh, on that uh, offensive line. But then you can talk about that for Grambling when you talk about what they put up uh, on the defensive front. Uh, just to give you some insight in terms of some of that matchup, uh, what they do is pretty fascinating, too, on the defense. And uh, when you talk about uh, what they're able to do up front uh, on defense, very talented in terms of uh, uh, defensive end. Uh, you have Varner, uh, who brings it uh, defensive end there. Nose guard is Banks, uh, Mullins. And we'll get you some sizes on some of these guys in terms of what they're able to do to confront what uh, North Carolina a and does on the front. So, like I said, it's going to be nice. And Grambling uh, D-line does have the depth. They're able to rotate players, mm -hmm. which I think both of these teams are able to do, which makes it interesting. And why they've gotten here, not everybody in the SWAT or MEAC has that experience in terms of that. You can line up your front people, mm -hmm. particularly defense, and you see a lot of teams are able to do that. But I think one of the reasons you see these teams playing at this time is because of the depth they're able to do and the way they're able to rotate these players right. and give them breaks to where they seem to always have their engine going. And, and that's why you course. see mm -hmm. so many sacks mm -hmm. and so many sacks from different people. Right. It's just not one person getting into the mix in a lot of ways. What are your thoughts on that? Well, to, to the point you made, I, one of the names that I'm looking for, and you see him lining up, uh, you'll see him uh, on the line, putting pressure, uh, blitzing from his linebacker spot, but SWAC defensive player of the year, Darius Christmas, uh, young man from Vicksburg, Mississippi, uh, came there from the East Mississippi Community College, and he just came in and took the SWAC by storm this past season, and is a, as a player that you will literally see all over the field, looking forward to what he can do against this tough uh, Aggie offensive line. Chad Jones says that defensive line is nine deep. I certainly know it's deep. Uh, Casey Price has said his his bad. He's going 28-10 Grambling. Uh, defensive front, let me give it to you now. I said Varner. That's Brandon Varner, 6'4", 250-pound junior, defensive end. Then at the nose guard, you have number 55, Linwood Banks, 6'1", 290-pound senior that's going to get in the mix. Defensive end. You have number eight, Anthony Mullen, 6'4", 270-pound, redshirt sophomore. And then you get into those linebackers as they play that 3-4. So let me give you those that those four linebackers, and they have one of them that plays, as they said, the cat position. So you have outside linebacker DeAndre Hopes, 6'2", uh, 215-pound, sophomore, who's all over the field. M middle linebacker who's just giving people nightmares is Jairus Christmas. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like uh, he may bring you a present. I don't know if you're going to like it. He's 5'10", 220-pound junior. Outside linebacker number 46, Deontay Hader, 6'1", 215-pound senior. And then you had a cat, which is 21, Perry Cargo, 6'2", 210-pound junior that can play up in the mix. Uh, he can make tackles. He can defend. Uh, tight end down the field, uh, so he really has the uh, the ability to be in the mix and play in a lot of positions there. So it'll be interesting when you talk about that front line of the Aggies going up against that front line of the uh, on the defensive side uh, for the Tigers there. So and uh, really uh, intrigued about that matchup and what we can watch for just to give some people some inside information there. What are your thoughts about some of those names and some of those players I just tossed in the mix there? Well. Uh the, the, some of the, some of the guys that I, I've watched throughout the course of the season, uh, and, and and it's very interesting with Gremlin, some of the things that they're able to do. Uh, another name that a lot of people don't know about, but he's almost a clone of of Martez Carter's and Damian Brooks. Uh, he, he's another guy who you know you'll see him in the backfield sometimes. You'll see him in the slot, you know, and he he is a matchup issue. I think matchup uh, nightmare. Exactly. So and. and those are some of the things that you're going to want to look for during the course of the game. Is when, if Gramlin can get some of these guys matched up against uh, the linebackers, I think the advantage Gramlin. Uh, that being said, uh, North Carolina A&T's receiver, we mentioned it before, but uh, Elijah Bell is just somebody who jumps out at me. Uh, big, physical, and going up against Gramlin's DB. So are they going to uh, slot him and have a cornerback following? We've seen that in the matchup last year between the, the Stella North Carolina Central cornerback 
uh, and the wide receiver uh, Jones from uh, Grambling yeah. in that matchup where they basically followed each other all over the field, which was a fascinating matchup. Do you see the same thing happening this week, so. or do you think people are going to no, I expect the same. I, whoever Grambling's best defensive back is, you got to shadow Elijah Bell. He is that big – a big play uh, threat for a and So it, that is a chess match unto itself, but we'll see what Bramley can do with, with that regard. Let's chime back in with some of these people in here going in here. Donna G is watching. Appreciate you going in there. She's looking forward to the game. I know she is. Uh, get some input there. Dexter Hill says defense wins championship. a and only gives up 12 points per game. Mm. Advantage Aggies, 31-17. I do agree that it, that they're not going to give up a points. But as some people said earlier, I'm not sure in the, in the MEAC are they used to seeing the type of offenses you see out of the SWAC. Great point. So I think that is going to be a little give and take there. But I still think this is going to be one on the defensive side of the ball in a lot of ways. KC Price chimes back in and says, will those big a t offensive linemen be able to deal with the quickness of the Graham defensive front? Kind of gave you that in terms of weight differential and the size difference. And I think you're – you're apt, in, uh, Casey Price, to talk about what you say, that uh, you're going to have that power struggle between the kickness, quickness. Yeah. Can Tigers get off the ball quick? Uh, and uh, they have to make sure they don't get a lot of penalties. But I think they're going to be trying to do that cadence, and that's where you're going to get the quarterback. Yeah. Is he able to change that cadence enough that it's going to slow down the front, yeah. defensive front, for them not to be able to get out the ball as fast? Because if they allow the Aggies – offensive line to get up on them, you're going to have a problem. And you're exactly right. Graham wants to get off the ball fast, and they want to move. And they want to get around these players so they can turn them on their feet mm -hmm. so they can make a buzz to uh, make a play at the quarterback position or mm -hmm. try to get to the running back before he gets started. So that's a little nugget as we go inside the numbers in terms of what you want to watch. Stan Hardy says he's going back and likes to poke the bear. He's talking about SU Jags winning the Bayou Classic days are over for a while. And he laughed it when he said it. Uh, Tina, uh, Varick told Tina, we're talking to football and get out of your feelings uh, in terms of that matchup there. Kincaid, Carter, Salmon, Ross, Clark, Jones, Lindsey on the field at the same time is going to be hell for a and <laughs> Tina says, I'm not in my feelings. We're talking about Graham and a and not Southern. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Tina. Get it. I like that. Go ahead. She, she talking. She talking a little. I like that. She got some style about herself. Talking about that. So as we have Mike trying to jump in here and join us, uh, give him a chance to get a little time on the mic uh, uh, as we get prepared for it. Anything else in terms of that matchup we talked about a little bit in, in regards to what's going on there? Well, I, I think it's going to be imperative. For, for Grandma's special teams to show up. We saw Mark Arasa, Orozco in the SWAC championship. He kicked uh, a career-long 48-yard field goal. I think that's a little bit... Uh, the special teams. We hadn't talked about teams. that. Special teams. Devon that uh, in the Bayou Classic, uh, the big uh, kickoff return against Southern, and it turned the momentum because no all the momentum was sitting on the no Jag sideline. So those are little little things that I think Grandma has to do. Uh, that and they've scored 112 points in the first quarter this uh, this season. They're one of the top teams uh, in the SWAC in terms of just getting out early and jumping on top of teams. So that's going to be huge for Graham. Antoinette Riley says the Roscoe is the man. Yes, he was up a finalist for the Ben L. Calvin Senior HBCU Football Award. Uh, so he certainly uh, gets all the kudos from me. He's very talented. He had a big kick. Uh, in the SWAC championship game as well. He's kicked like that all year long, yes, and he's he's money Yeah, from 40 yards plus. And so I that'll think. be interesting. Mike, you ready to jump in here and give us some updates? We're talking a little bit about this matchup. We're not we're teasing about the number. We're not going too far on the numbers. We did tell them that we're going to do the live show there before the game where we'll really go inside the depth of the numbers. But we gave a little bit of terms of the – Offensive line from North Carolina a and and the defensive front for the Aggies. We'll save uh, the other matchup uh, for later. But what are your thoughts uh, coming into this matchup? Yeah, first of all, I'm going to say, Chad, please <laughs> put the pom-poms down. Look at the numbers across the board. I understand the emotion is overcoming, overwhelming, but to all the Gremlin fans, I think that Vegas has it wrong. They had, you know, if you look at different reports, they have – uh, Grambling at plus five, plus six, plus seven, give or take. I think the most I saw was plus nine. If you look at balance across the board, you look at uh, Grambling's t t turnover margin, but if you look at other statistics, complete balance across the board, it's hard to not 
look at what this North Carolina Aggies the team can do, especially on that third element, that, that special teams piece. That's one element that Grandma is not leading us back. And I'll stop right there. I'll, leave the, I'll call that a Big Mike teaser right there because we'll go into the numbers on Saturday. So um, the other thing is I heard you guys talking about All-America. What is it that North Carolina has, what, what 12 people? 12 that are, all MEAC selections. Yeah, all MEAC selections. Man, that's incredible. How can you overlook that? So the, to me, it's a win for both. It's a win for the – you're going to have a good game. But <laughs> Chad, so you've been talking numbers all year long. That's right. <laughs> you've been wrong. <laughs> Chad, have you put the pom pom down? <laughs> so, Go ahead, Mike. So, no, I, I apologize. I thank you. But I think the real, the real win is this game in and of itself and what it means. Dexter Hill says, speaking of special teams, don't kick the ball to Chris Gardner. Absolutely. Ooh, Chris Gardner. That's another Absolutely. name. I hadn't even mentioned Chris Gardner. Don't kick. Don't Woo. kick. Avoid Chris Gardner. Chad says Graham has 12 all swag selection. <laughs> so, um, so it's a nice little mix up here, boy. This is going to be absolutely. fun on Saturday as we talk about getting into all of the feelings, and we certainly want you to chime in. Uh, let me give it back to you, Mike, in regards to some additional thoughts you may have in terms of what you're looking at there. Yeah, yeah, and, and you guys talked about the size comparison, the size along the line. Um, the other thing is, you mentioned Martez Carter, but you, uh, does North Carolina have an X factor of its own? I think Mar Marquise Cartwright is an is a, is yes. a, a X factor in terms of we've been talking about you know A and T being explosive passing the ball, but mm -hmm. you know he, he's an All Miac uh, running back as well. He's, he gives them that power on the ground. And who's number one leading the uh, Miac? Yes, in, in, yes okay, indeed, yeah. so. So, yes, both teams have that X factor. Yes, Mar but I, I do, to be honest, I think it's more important for Martez Carter to have a big game, whereas A&T, you'll probably, you can spread the ball out, have a little bit more balance. Mm -hmm. So, no, I think that's a great point when you're looking at, uh, trying to hold on a little bit. Uh, we had Coach Willie Simmons uh, actually trying to call in. They have already put him on the clock in FAMU. He's at QB Club Banquet. So he's trying to sneak out to call in and give us a little bit of update and give uh, a, a farewell, if you would, officially to his Prairie View fans. So trying to hold on just a little bit if you bear with us in regards to what's going Don't on there. Give me more punishment. <laughs> <laughs> That's part of what I was talking about there. Um, but um, in terms of the poll, we froze the poll this week uh, just to give you a little insight in terms of what's going on there. Obviously, Mike, you didn't get a chance to talk about this, but last week we announced the official mid-major poll ranking where you had a first time ever a share yep. uh, for the number one ranking with Langston University and Virginia State Trojans. What were your thoughts on, on that? I, oddly enough, you know, you're going to sit down, you're going to take a deep breath, but I actually agree with the poll. Oh! <laughs> Look out here! First time ever... <laughs> I actually agree with that, Sherry. I thought it was hard to decipher if you look at kind of the complete resume of both teams over the over big the wins on both sides all so, year long. Well, against tough competition, uh, played pretty much the same way in the playoffs in terms of not being able to step up. I'm sure as both teams wanted uh, uh, in terms of their matchup. So I, I thought uh, when we ran the numbers that it fell out that way. I guess I'll give you a chance. I mean, you said a little bit uh, last week about that, but did you have any major concerns with the uh, two uh, ranked teams there? No, not at all. Uh, both very deserving, and uh, they had tremendous seasons. I uh, just watched Trent Cannon uh, for Virginia State was just one of uh, a tremendous running back and probably one of uh, you know top three in terms of all HBC running backs this past season for Virginia. He's State. very talented. You think he'll get a shot on something? He should. Yeah, uh, he should. Uh, he, draft I think he's, or he's participating in some uh, postseason bowls and whatnot. So uh, postseason All Star games, I say. But uh, he puts on a good show, and I think he'll he'll get a shot. Yeah, I I want to go back to uh, one point where you mentioned prospects. I mean, you look at you look at across the board, going back to Grambling and A and T, and even some of the CIAA team. Do we have kind of an increase in potential prospects, or is it just we're on the cuff of a couple of good years? No, I think you make an excellent point there in terms of that question. I'm sure John Grant would like to believe that the celebration uh, in terms of the exposure that it's providing, particularly for the MEAC SWAC and those teams playing in the game, has a trickle-down effect uh, in, in that manner. 
with providing additional exposure to the level, <coughs> excuse me, that the NFL teams get a chance to see them a little more, which is always a good thing. In mm -hmm. that. Uh, what are your thoughts on it? Yeah, uh, very much so. I, I think, you know, uh, uh, you, you're starting to see a shift uh, in terms of uh, schools being very serious with regards to who they're recruiting and, and going out and getting talent. I mean, it's it's, it's about winning, and, and you make uh, the statement all the time, you know, such and such is in the business of football. And we're starting to see, you know, just kind of this talent uh, kind of mushroom all throughout HBCU football where, you know, we go back to uh, just a couple of years ago, Tariq Cohen uh, at North Carolina and and we're seeing what he is uh, has done uh, on the NFL level. Chad wow. Williams getting a shot third round last oh, yeah. year with uh, Arizona Cardinals. Uh, Brandon Parker is a guy who you definitely going to watch uh, for North Carolina and T. So uh, we're, you know, in a bit of a renaissance here in terms of some of that talent coming back to us. I, I mean, I think that's an appropriate way to describe it. It's a renaissance. It mm -hmm. seems like in the last three, give or take years, we've yeah. seen a few folks you know, and Tariq Cohen's, you know, he's representing for the little Very dudes, much too. Him. Very much you know, so. Oh, he's Such all over the place and playing some fanatic so. ball. He's probably about to be <laughs> bright light of Chicago. Uh, exactly. <laughs> exactly. For those doing the exact same mm -hmm. things he was doing at a &T. Yeah, it's funny because they put it on there and everybody says, look, we're like, yeah, we saw enough. Right, right. exactly. We saw a lot like, of that. Him first, uh, so. All of that and stuff like that. Well, before we, uh, before we kind of uh, tune it off and get ready uh, to hit the uh, – road, I guess you would say, hit the planes in terms of the airs and get ready for the Any last uh, thoughts for you, Charles? Uh, yeah, uh, been a tremendous season, uh, both MIAC and SWAC, CIAA, SEAC, uh, Gulf Coast Conference, uh, just in terms of the talent that we watched and uh, definitely all the coaches and, and athletic directors, presidents that have been on the show, a huge thank you uh, in terms of going into this celebration bowl. Certainly, and Tad Jones uh, rightly and so said, don't forget about Chester Rogers with Chester the coaches Rogers and the coach. Exactly, yeah. Very solid. So I'm glad you put that out there uh, too as well. Mike, any final thoughts from you? No, I just echo uh, my colleague Charles here. Uh, thanks for the support. Yeah. Uh, and that goes from not only the ADs, the coaches, even the presidents. Of course, it helps when you have a well dressed. Dr. Cavill on the, you know, leading the team, exactly. who allows us five minutes. But thank, <laughs> nevertheless, thank you for your support. Thank you for the fans. You make this thing big. It's been a tremendous year, not only in the mid majors, but in the, in the uh, major divisions. We've had big. T uh, we have prospects. We have a bowl coming up. We have big deals with Nike, and then we have a lot of movement in the coaching and uh, AD rank. So it's been a very dynamic year. Right. So I've been. Uh, I've just been blessed to be a part of it. Exactly. Great point in regards to a dynamic year and in a lot of ways it's just getting started uh we still have several coaching spots out there now we have multiple ad spots out there mm -hmm. yeah. uh potentially we're looking at the commissioner spot as well yeah. in terms of what's going on we have the uh schools moving in terms of different divisions yeah. so those things are taking place and with that uh, I just want to say thanks to all the fans that have chimed in during this hour uh, with your commentary. Hope you enjoyed the show. Please look for us uh, Saturday uh, as we do 9 to 11. That's 9 to 11 Eastern time, so that's uh, 8 uh, to 10 uh, pr prior to the game. We'll be in the stadium, so watch out for us, and we'll be ready to go to really take you inside the numbers in the matchup and hopefully get you to think about some things that you hadn't seen. Obviously, we'll go inside the number, and at the end, we'll pick – our winner of the game in terms of also giving you some point spreads that you can look at in terms of what's going on there uh, in terms of that. Chad had one final thing. i like to put this out there. Since he's on it, we won't escape it. He Ooh. says Spears to Valley. Uh, that would be interesting, interesting in terms of what's going on there. Chad had the really go. I hope it happens. Yeah. <laughs> Dexter Ooh. Hill, make sure I threw this in there. Aggie Pride uh, in terms of what's going on there for sure. Uh, as the G-Men get it done uh, also in terms of the fine price. So it's good to have both these Aggies and Tigers and all these other Swack and Miag fans on. Thank you for your time. I am Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, the sports professor with Mike Washington and Charles Bishop. As we come to a close, we hope you enjoyed our conversation with uh, the executive director of the Celebration Bowl, uh, John Grant, giving you some updates of what to expect when you get in town to Atlanta. Big time weekend there. 
And we want to thank you for listening to Dr. Cavill's Inside HBC Sports Lab Radio Show with Mike Watson and Charles Bishop every Tuesday right here from 5 45 to 7 15 right here on KCOH TV 92.9 FM HD2. The Vane, we're pumping your system in the historic KCOH studio in Houston, Texas, www.kcoh-tv.com. Follow me, Dr. Kenyatta Cavill, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. That's D R K E N Y A T T A C A V I L. Again, remember to tune in Saturday. Uh, right here, Central Time, 8 to 10, Eastern Time, 9 to 11, before the kickoff game. Uh, we'll get you inside the numbers. And as we say, dream big, continue to move forward. We will talk with you soon. Of course, course let's you dismiss. And we want to thank Dr. Cavill and Charles and Mike and uh, for what all they do in all of the uh, historically black schools. And, again, uh, the spread is minus 3, North yeah. Carolina Central minus yeah. 3. And uh, we'll put a number in regards to the points over and under. Uh-huh. We're going to do that on the game also, and we're going to take it even a step further. These, uh, we don't want to treat this game like a novice uh, in regards to what they do out in Las Vegas. So we have a first quarter <laughs> over and under, a halftime over and under, and a third quarter over and under uh, before we get out of here. So uh, keep listening. We're going to take the game to another level in regards to the celebration. If you want to be a celebration bowl, we're going to give somebody, somebody's going to be celebrating somewhere. That's right. Because yes. these numbers Absolutely. we put out here. Minus Somebody three. going to be celebrating big. Yeah, one final three. one final shout out to Tina. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, with that, look for us. Make sure you're tuning in right here for the rest of the week uh, from 5 to 7 Central Time. Uh, be surprised. You need to look through the show because we're going to find a way to call in and give you some updates throughout the week of what's going on. So don't miss uh, Ralph Cooper Sports Wrap. Uh, you never know when we'll call in and give you that update as you preparing to get down to Atlanta. I just want to listen in to the festivities. Again, thank you for all those that tune in. And uh, Chocolate Twine Company said it'll be in action. <laughs> <laughs> Tyler Saddle. <laughs>